was really nerve wracking mm -hmm. from being the biggest editor of one of the biggest UK wedding magazines mm -hmm. to then leaving and representing your own brand. Are big weddings a waste of money? Weddings in the last 10 years have just become crazy in my opinion. Everything has doubled, tripled, quadrupled in price, in terms of extravagance, in terms of expectation. It can be difficult to keep up with the standard. Now with all the digital resources you have to Pinterest, Instagram, TikTok, all of these amazing wedding blogs, it can be overwhelming and yes. you do feel the pressure. The average cost of an Indian wedding when I looked it up on Google in London is between 50 to 100,000 pounds. There are so many bad things that are happening in the world. Should really people be spending millions on weddings? What's the average cost of a wedding? You could get a beautiful venue, anything from seven to 10,000 pounds. Starting outfits, you can get as cheap as 1,000 pounds all the way up to 10,000 pounds. If you want a really amazing videographer or a photographer, they charge 3,000 pounds. Makeup artists can vary anything from 300 pounds all the way to 1,500 pounds. Catering varies from 40 pound a head per person all the way up to 200 pound per person. From on the day coordination, which can be anything from 2,000 pounds, to a wedding planner getting 10,000 pounds. The less is endless of how much you can have for a wedding. Anisha Vasani. Hi. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Oh, thank you so much, darling. So lovely to be here. Are you ready? I am. <laughs> Born ready for you, babe. <laughs> so I'm really happy to have you here. I feel like this is a topic um, that I've been wanting to talk about since I started my podcast is something I'm so deeply passionate about. It's something I have debates around all the time. And it's great to actually get you here because you're in this industry and you can give me a different perspective. I hope so. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> but just before we start, you know, when I was looking at your role, you're a luxury wedding director, you're a creative director, you help out celebrities and you do influencer campaigns and you're a wedding planner as well. And now you do some PR. Tell me about all those things. How are they all linked? Sometimes I don't even know how, how I even do it. I think I could literally just be like, how do I manage all of that mm -hmm. even in a day? And I just think sometimes I just like, I feel like my brain is completely fried because, you know, right. when you're juggling so many different roles. Yeah. But it's all I've ever known. Because obviously when I was uh, the editor of Asiana, um, I was literally just 23, 24 when I joined. Right. So I literally went straight from graduating in uni. I did a broadcast journalism degree. Right. And then literally was like, okay, I now want to go into the media industry. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be a, pro a broadcast presenter mm -hmm. um, for reading the news or whether I actually wanted to go into fashion journalism. Okay. And it was only until I worked at the Daily Mirror and was on their fashion desk um, as a junior writer that I realized that actually my passion was to uh, pursue my career in fashion journalism. Wow. And at the time when I did actually leave university, I was offered a job um, at Sunrise's um, sister company, uh, DAB uh, sister radio uh, station called uh, Yar Radio. Right. So I did a few shows on there. So I used to have my own very own Bollywood show, wow. which was fun. Uh, but then at the same time, went the, to the Sunrise Lifestyle Show. Mm -hmm. I met the former editor of Asia at the time. And actually they were looking for an editorial stylist. Wow. So I thought, okay, great. And they said that you get to work both in the editorial department, um, be a writer and also then do the styling for the fashion shoots. So it was literally a dream come true to actually get a job at the biggest magazine at the time. Right. Um, Asiana Magazine and Asiana Wedding. Yes. And then literally a year after I was promoted to being the editor. So I was the youngest editor wow. of two consecutive magazines, wow. which was just a dream come true. And there... I was trained literally from going from being, and I used to style all my shoots. Right. Um, I used to something because I started from a styling background. Mm -hmm. I wanted to actually foresee and be very hands on mm -hmm. on my shoots because I think it, that's what makes it special. I think, mm -hmm. you know, when you're actually creatively directing it, but you're styling it and you've got the vision, you're bringing the whole mood board to life and working mm -hmm. with the models and concepts and traveling the world, you know, and doing beautiful fashion campaigns. Mm -hmm. But then I was also literally presenting for Asiana TV. So I kind of then got the best of both worlds, was able to use my presenting skills mm -hmm. and then do my fashion, sh like my fashion campaigns. Mm -hmm. And then my publisher goes, right, um, we'd like for you now to curate the fashion shows. Right. So we want you to creatively direct the fashion shows as well. 
So what I does thought, that mean, creative so direct? You actually basically coordinate the whole show from start to finish. And right. Asiana Bridal Shows were the best bridal show at that time that every bride would come to see once right. a year annually in you know prestigious venues and hotels in London. Yeah. So it was great for me because I got to really experience a variety of different roles. Mm. I was in networking um, at a lot of events, being invited to a lot of red carpet events. Mm -hmm. And everything I've learned is what I've now put into my own brand and my business. Right. Um, I've worked with so many models, so many celebrities over the years at Asiana. Right. So it just almost, everything just kind of flowed really beautifully and naturally for my own brand. Mm. It was really nerve wracking mm -hmm. from being the biggest editor of one of the biggest UK wedding magazines to mm -hmm. then leaving and representing your own brand. And, you know, in God's grace, I had a really good re relationship with a lot of my clients mm -hmm. that, you know, I used to work very, very closely with. And they continue to have a relationship with me after I left. And, you know, after there was a whole social media um, revolution and everything kind of just changed because everything went digital. And that was at the pinnacle of my career where I was leaving Asiana. And then brands wanted to do campaign shoots for their own Instagrams, right. their own websites. Mm. So it was the perfect timing for the transition. Right. Was I nervous? Was I scared? Of course, because I thought, yeah. wow, I've been part of this big brand and, and a team. now and a mm. team. And that was the hardest part. Mm. I missed working as part of a team. Mm. But now I've been fortunate to form an amazing team. And all of the amazing freelancers and the creative team I work with, they've all become amazing associates, but they've now yeah. also become really good friends. Yeah. So it just kind of all just really fell through naturally. And a lot of people that I used to meet, whether they were industry friends, would say, we want you to plan our wedding. Wow. So the first wedding I planned was for Rishi Rich when he got married. And he said, I'm not getting married unless you're, you're going to plan it. So wow. that was the first wedding I ever planned. And it went really well. And I loved it. So mm. a lot of the brides would come to me and say, look, we'd love for you to, you know, everyone in the wedding industry. Right. From obviously them being the clients of, yes. you know, of yourself at the magazine. So it makes sense for you to do it. Mm. And it was a bit of a challenge at first, but I think when you do everything with so much grace, love and passion, deep it in your heart, good. nothing feels like work. And, you know, why not? Whilst I can do it, why, why not? Why not Absolutely. be able to just achieve your dreams and have different kind of umbrellas of your business? Because mm. it's Anisha Fasani creates now creative consultancy. Right. And from that creative consultancy, it focuses and specializes in campaign photo shoots all the way up to bespoke PR, influencer events, mm. celebrity campaigns, and then private bespoke weddings. So right. I'll only do very limited bespoke mm. weddings, but up to like 10 a year. Right. So I won't take on too many weddings, but just ones that I feel, oh, this is a lovely wedding to actually work with. And it's been nice. Amazing. And in all that, with all the different things you do, what's your why? My why would be, I think, do and achieve and work towards your goals mm -hmm. and have purpose. Mm. The biggest, most rewarding thing for me is seeing my small brands become mm. super brands. Right. And I'm all about empowering women. And I really want everyone to take that plunge and not have that fear. Right. If you believe in a vision, there's so many mm. women that I've seen have amazing corporate jobs mm. and I've seen them then flourish in their dreams, exactly what, what you're doing. <laughs> um, and, you know, they're actually fulfilling their passions and things that they've always wanted to just fulfill. Mm. And I, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that I'm able to pay that role right. in their journey. Yeah. So my why is to be able to see other brands and other women grow and achieve their dreams. That's amazing. The topic that we want to talk about today. Yeah. Are big weddings a waste of money? Oh my God. Weddings in the last 10 years have just become crazy in my opinion. Everything has doubled, tripled, quadrupled in price, in terms of extravagance, in terms of expectation. And I think for a lot of women and men, it can be difficult to keep up with the standard. Now, the average cost of an Indian wedding, when I looked it up on Google, in London is between 50 to 100,000 pounds. And I wouldn't even say that's gonna get you everything, would you? No. So what, from your perspective on the weddings that you've done, what's the average cost of a wedding, an so Indian wedding? An average cost of an Indian wedding now can be exactly what Google is saying. Uh, anything from 50,000, you can have a beautiful, intimate 
wedding, which a okay. lot of couples are going for, mm -hmm. especially after the pandemic. A lot of um, Indian couples, Asian couples are now going for like a civil ceremony mm. and then a beautiful kind of small intimate dinner mm -hmm. um, or they'll have an intimate reception. Right. And we've seen now that the number of guests have really decreased. Yes. But you'll be surprised. We thought that the spend might also decrease. Right. The spend has actually increased, increased. Yeah. because they want their family and friends that they haven't been able to see. And it was horrible to see brides and grooms mm -hmm. go through that constantly postponing, delaying, changing. It was a really emotional it is. time for a lot of bridal couples to experience mm. that in the pandemic. And I think when they were able to celebrate again, mm. they've just, I think they're so happy to be with their friends and family and finally be able to celebrate their unity and their love, not just as a couple and with, you know, their, you know, families, immediate families, but extended family and friends mm. that they actually now want to give their guests that experience. Right. And so they're increasing how much they're spending right. on a wedding per person, but they're just lowering the number of guests that they're going to invite. Because, you know, Siobhan, it's changed so much from about 20 to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when our parents and our cousins yes. got married in school halls. Yes, with a thousand you people. You know, with a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And there was a buffet lunch. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have really come a long way since then. We have. Where everyone's literally getting married in beautiful venues, yes. hotels, barns, um, destination weddings. And everyone is really curating their wedding because now with all the digital mm. resources you have to Pinterest, mm. Instagram, TikTok, all of these amazing wedding blogs, it can be overwhelming. Yes. And you do feel the pressure because you're constantly trying to make your wedding different to the rest. That's what every bride and groom that comes to me is how can we make our wedding look different from our friend's wedding or our cousin's wedding right. or our brother and sister's wedding. So it really does put pressure on us, but it's a great pressure right. because it challenges us as wedding suppliers. It challenges myself as a wedding planner of thinking, okay, what are we going to do to create something really different? Right. And now it's all about the experience. You want your guests to have an amazing experience from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And yes, prices have increased. Yes. And, you know, budgets for weddings have increased. You can have a beautiful wedding, spending 50,000 pounds and do something really intimate with 30 to 50 people. And then there's the the top end of it where, you know, weddings can go up to, as you know, yes. million, two million, three million yes. pounds, right? right? Even more. Right. Um, and it's all about disposable income. It's yes. all about each individual's preferences, personal choice, what they can afford yes. and what they feel is, you know, something that they want to invest in. Whether it's, you know, they're coming from, you know, an affluent background or they're just a middle class working couple, mm. you will sometimes feel that they will be able to actually invest that money because they've saved for weddings their whole life. Whether mm. culturally the parents have saved or they've saved their whole life. If, even just using myself as an, as an example, I've saved for my wedding because my right. mom has said to me, one day when you get married, let's put a little bit away in savings every time. So you right. call it the wedding pot or the wedding fund. Yes. And I've saved my whole life for my wedding. Right. Um, just from a young age, even before I was in the wedding industry. And now being in the wedding industry, yes. there's even more pressure. Of course. Because when I do get married, of course, you're going to... <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, what is she wearing? Yes. Which makeup artist does she use? Yes. What caterer does she use? Where does she get married? Mm. But I think if you make your wedding personal to you mm. and you have the dream wedding that you desire as a couple, then I think you will have the most magical wedding of your dreams. I think waste of money is defined in different ways by different people. It is. So someone can call going out for dinner a waste of money. Someone exactly. can call buying designer items a waste of money. Someone can call investing in a business a waste of money. Exactly. So people define it in a different way. But the thing that strikes me the most is the pressure to have a big wedding. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think, within the Indian communities, because like you said, there is a culture around you save up for your wedding. You know, it's our desire as parents for you to have a big wedding. And there's also this competition amongst communities and competition amongst families that even if the bride and groom do not want a big wedding, the parents have been to all their friends' weddings and their children's weddings and whatever, and they have to reciprocate. So for the bride and groom who actually wants something simple, now have to have this massive wedding 
for their parents or for their friends. Like you said, there's that pressure of social media where you can compare and contrast everything. I want mine to be different. I want mine to be bigger. I want mine to be better. How do you handle that pressure as a bride or a groom? You'll be surprised actually now because every bridal couple that I'm planning their wedding for for this year and next year and 2024, Mm -hmm. they're not actually pressurized by their parents anymore. Wow. There was times where you would actually sit with the parents Mm. and the couple Mm. for your wedding planning consultations. Now, it's so lovely to see that the couples have a voice and the couples are making the decisions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the weddings I'm working on at the moment, they are actually, you know, going and planning their wedding and getting asked to create a wedding Mm -hmm. that is personal to them. Right. Whether they're getting married, I'm planning one wedding where they're getting married in their own home. Wow. In their garden. And it's small, intimate wedding. The numbers mm-hmm. are like 100, 150 people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and the, the families are happy. Right. And I think the pandemic really changed everyone's mindset. Absolutely. That just because auntie and uncles, nieces and nephews were invited to, you, you know, uh, you went to their, their son yes. or daughter's wedding, doesn't mean now that you have to invite them to your wedding. And mm-hmm. I think couples are now having more of a say yes. with their parents and their family, and they're not being pressurized as much. And we've seen this shift. Mm-hmm. And yes, there are some families that, of course, the parents are there. Of they course. have a say. They want to have that wedding and they want to actually throw their children this beautiful, extravagant wedding. Yes. So I think it really varies. Yeah. Uh, you know, by choice and just different cultures and different, you know, couples. Absolutely. But one thing is consistent. The prices for all of these things have gone up astronomically. Of so let's just talk about rough prices. So venue hire in London, let's say an average wedding is 300 people. How much would that be? So if it can vary, you can have a beautiful wedding, anything from 80,000 up to 150,000. For the venue only? The venue would cost anything from, you can get venues as cheap as £10,000 now. £10,000, okay. Yeah. But now, now a good venue could be anything from twenty all the way up to thirty, forty thousand. 40000 Okay. So it let, depends whether you're, you're with us. We have yes. lots of lead up, right? We have a right. whole week we do. of wedding celebrations. Yes. So it starts from the henna party to the holy ceremony mm-hmm. to the sangeet, the menli mm-hmm. party, and then going off to the civil because we still have our yes. civil. Then you have the wedding and then you have the reception. Right. You're having a whole week of events. Mm. It's going to add up. Absolutely. And some couples are now just saying, we don't want to go for the traditional wedding. Yeah. We just want to have a civil ceremony and, and have, have a really big party. Yeah. And that's what a lot of couples are opting for and it's becoming a trend. And I think it's about personal preference. Like preference. Yes. If you want to have a traditional wedding, I want to have a traditional wedding. Right. I want to have a destination wedding because it's something that I've dreamt of and I've desired, you know, since I've been a young girl. But I want to have the traditional wedding because Mm -hmm. one, I'm the eldest daughter Mm -hmm. and I want to give that to my parents culturally because I know my brother who's younger than me isn't going to want that. He's already said to mum and dad, everything you want to do, all the fuss, do it with Anisha because I'm just going to have a civil ceremony and then just a small party. Right. But I think it's all on personal choice. If I didn't want to and I just told my mum and dad, um, it's the opposite. My mum's actually saying to me, have a small wedding. And I'm like, mm, no, you know what? You guys have waited yeah. your whole life for this moment. So have I. Yeah. I want to celebrate. Yeah. I do. But that's my choice. Exactly. And I think it's all about personal preference. So let's go through the prices. So let's look at the minimum. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at the minimum, not the range. What's the minimum cost of a venue in London? A minimum, you could get a beautiful venue for anything from seven to ten thousand pounds starting. What about the outfits for the women and the men? Outfits you can get as cheap as a thousand pounds all the way up to a designer piece for ten thousand pounds. Okay. Now the cinematography and video free. If you want a really amazing videographer or a photographer, they charge three thousand pounds. A day? A day. Okay. That includes the album, the hours, the editing. Right. All that time that goes into obviously producing the last final yes, edits. Of course. Makeup artists. Right. Makeup artists can vary anything from three hundred pounds all the way to one thousand five hundred pounds. Um catering. Catering varies from forty pounds a head per person all the way up to two hundred pounds per person. Wow. Anything else I'm missing? Event event coordination, on the day coordination. Event coordination. Event can planner. Start, it depends because obviously you could come on and work with a couple three months before. Right. Or you could be on their whole journey from a year. Right. I'm working on a couple that's getting married in 2023. Wow. And started in 2021. So I've been on a journey oh with them God. for two years. 
Wow. So it varies. It can be from anything from on the day coordination, which can be anything from two thousand pounds to a wedding planner getting ten thousand pounds. Stationary. Stationary varies because it's all dependent on what you want. Right. So like, you know, menus, invites, can anything be like from anything from like ten pound ahead mm -hmm. going all the way up to twenty, thirty pound ahead. You can even get beautiful e invites now. Right. Exactly. To save costs. Yes. Save the date. Exactly. And it hardly costs anything. Any other costs I'm missing? There's transport. Okay. There's cars. Mm -hmm. There's hairstylists because now you can get a makeup artist and a, and a hairstylist. Okay. You've got your jewelry. Right. Oh, You've yeah. got awesome. all your entertainment, your DJ, your production. <laughs> I'm still old, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Performers, dancers. The less is endless of how mm -hmm. much you can have for a wedding. So, you know, it really, mm -hmm. really varies. So the average cost you're saying is around £100,000. Yeah. And that's for how many people? So you can do that with 100 people all the way up to 500 people. A thousand pounds per person? Literally. My God. But that's for the wedding and the reception. It's two events. We've um, all Sometimes heard- Sometimes they even, even squeeze in a civil in the daytime. Yeah, I've heard that. People yeah. do three in one. Now we've all heard about the MUA scam. A lot of people are looking at that because they're thinking, is my event planner worth it? Is my makeup artist worth it? Is my hair person worth it? Is my caterer worth it? Whatever it is, people start then to question everything in the wedding industry. Now, one thing I find a bit of a problem is that nothing is regulated and there's no clear price on what something is. And a lot of my friends at the moment will call up a DJ and get his price. And two days later, they'll call up the DJ's group. And they'll give them a different price. And it can feel very overwhelming. Like you said, when you've got all of these pressures of getting married, that people are giving you different quotes and people are trying to take advantage of you because they know that you're in a desperate situation. Now, I want to talk about the MUA scam because it's one of the most recent things that people have been talking Everyone's about. talking about. And what somebody was saying, um, the whole reason why this MUA scam came out was this girl was saying that when I get married and I book a makeup artist, why is it that... I have to pay extra because it's my wedding day. So if I went to Jimmy Choo and I bought a pair of shoes for 500 pounds, when I go to Jimmy Choo and tell them I'm getting married, they wouldn't suddenly increase the price to 800 pounds. So why do makeup artists take advantage of you? But that is their set prices because it's based on their years of experience mm -hmm. and their skill set. Right. Now, if you're going to want to, like you said, you said you're going to go and buy a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference with going and shopping in Primark mm -hmm. and then going to Jimmy Choo. Mm -hmm. Right, you're paying for their talent. For sure. They've been, you know, these makeup artists are charging this much. They have been in the industry for 15, some of them 40 years mm. in the industry. And you are literally paying for their talent, mm. their skill set. You know, where they've they invest so much money into training themselves and keeping up to their trends and to educating themselves and learning all the skill sets mm. when they go to learn even from different makeup artists like mario kim's uh, yes. makeup artist how much do you think they all charge yeah they charge extortionate about like jlo's makeup artists mm. they are extortionate but you're paying for the brand right when you're going to go and shop with chanel a five thousand mm -hmm. pound bag mm -hmm. you're paying for the brand Mm. These makeup artists are now brands. When you're going to go and get a Sub Yasachi outfit or a designer outfit, no one questions the difference between a designer outfit mm -hmm. and a high street designer shop. I guess the question is, if I'm going for party makeup, why is that different from wedding makeup? Because they spend so much longer on your makeup. Right. The so duration it's about the quality. of any makeup artist will spend anything from three to four, uh, three to four hours. Right. And it's not, it's literally, they are then obviously buying those amazing products. Mm. They would have premium products in their kits. Right. And you're paying for a premium service. Right. You're, they, you know, they're providing hair extensions, mm. they're providing lashes as extensions. Mm -hmm. They are there literally spending time doing the makeup with you. They're traveling mm -hmm. to A to B to wherever mm -hmm. your destination is. Mm -hmm. And they are doing your makeup draws. They're talking to you about the looks. They're doing the makeup on yourself. They're in making sure that they're prepping your skin yeah. before giving you all that advice right. on your on your makeup like trials that you go to. Mm -hmm. And then they're creating the makeup, creating your hair, styling your hair, and then doing your dressing. Right. So it's not just about the makeup. And I think that's what everyone's forgetting. Mm -hmm. It's about the entire look. And they're obviously the, the makeup artist is the first person you see mm -hmm. other than your wedding planner. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are holding your hand the whole step of the way, ensuring that your nerves are calm, I that, you know, that. you're literally excited. You know, you're talking about your whole wedding week. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that are going to make you look amazing on mm -hmm. your wedding day. Mm -hmm. And again, it's your personal choice. Right. There are makeup artists out there that charge 300 pounds. 
Right. You can go with them mm. per event. There's makeup artists that will charge £1,500 mm -hmm. because they are more experienced. Right. They are a brand within themselves. Mm. And it's their skill set that you're paying for. And I think we need to respect that when a caterer will charge that kind of money, mm -hmm. it's acceptable. Mm. Like we're saying, if a fashion brand is going to charge that kind of money, it's acceptable. Mm. But why is it not acceptable for a wedding planner or a makeup artist to get paid for what they deserve to get paid? And they've got to make, it's their livelihood, Shivani. Mm. Everyone forgets that. They've got to make Absolutely. some profit in it as well. Mm. You it's know? their job. And, and, and it's a choice. There's a variety of makeup artists there that are affordable, that charge £300. You can go for them and you can book them. Right. But if you want the best of the best and you're paying mm -hmm. for a brand, they are going to come at a price. I heard the story once that a lady went up to Picasso and said, can you paint a picture for me? And he said, sure. And he did it in about four minutes. And then when he told her the price, she was like, what do you mean you're charging me this much? It just took you four minutes. And, it, and he said, but it took me like 25 years to learn that. Exactly. How to do it in four minutes. Yeah. And I think often we do look at things as face value. I spoke to Shabika last week, f founder of Papa Don't Preach. And she said, people just look at the outfit for the outfit. You don't think about the design. Process. You don't think about the material. You don't think about how mm. many people have had to restitch it, relook at it, redesign it. You know, you don't think about the process it goes mm. through. And, you know, when people compare it to copies, of course, it's much cheaper because you haven't taken the, the same time. You haven't paid for people fair wages. You haven't used the right materials. You haven't had a whole team that sat, sat there brainstorming, what should we do next? So it's so very true. difficult, you know, when we question a lot of these people's professions and say, why aren't you cheaper? I think it's all about choice. And I think in this whole conversation, what I really want to get across is it is about your choice and it's about what you want to do. But at the same time, I do think there needs to be some regulation in terms of fair pricing. That's and what I mean by that, if I'm going to say to you, it costs me, you 500 pounds to come on my podcast. I don't charge anyone for coming on my podcast. <laughs> but let's just say I said to you, look, Anisha, it's going to cost you 500 pounds to come on my podcast. But then the next person I said it's 600. That's that not can fair. feel unfair. Of course. And that should not be right. And I think that's what people are asking for within this is like, can there be some sort of regulation? I think that is fair. But I think it isn't fair to question their skill. I don't think it's quite fair to question their credibility. Because like you said, it's not about where they are now. It's about how long it took them to get, get there. And as everybody knows is in the creative industry watching this, you always do work for free in the beginning. 100%. Always. You're always losing I money. still, you know, if I get an amazing opportunity yes. to work with a big celebrity that I've always wanted to work with mm -hmm. or, you know, do a campaign, you will go and do test shoots. Of course. Because you want to add something to your portfolio that you don't have. And we support one another in our industry. Mm -hmm. I work with an amazing team of creatives mm -hmm. and they will come and do campaign shoots. Yes. And they've never say, why should I not get paid for this? Yes. They see it as an opportunity to expand their portfolio, to be creative and be able to create. And I think that... There should be no limitations on that. Absolutely. And I think that when you often do things for free, you have no idea where it's going to take you. So there was this girl that I knew and she modeled for a test shoot in India. And she was, she's a, she was a full-time model. And someone said to her, will you model for my vlog? And she was a bit like, oh, I don't know. But the shoot was in like Jaipur. So she was like, all right, I'm not doing anything this weekend. Why? May as well. From that, she got founded by Sabia Sachi. From that, she got founded by Charlotte Tilbury. From doing You'll one be amazed free at how many opportunities can come out. Yeah. Of From just one doing, free shoot. Exactly. We've grafted. We've mm -hmm. all worked really, really hard. And you can assess whether this mm -hmm. is going to be an opportunity that is going to benefit with you. Exactly. Does it mean that, you know, you always have to do paid work? And it doesn't mean that you always have to do, sorry, it doesn't mean you always have to do free work. And it doesn't mean that, you know, for something you don't want to do, that you should do free work. You should know in yourself, is this an opportunity for me or am I being very stubborn and being like, well, I'm only going to do things that I get paid for. Absolutely. And so I think when something is in your heart, I don't get paid for the podcast. I lose money, mm. but it's still something I really enjoy. So if someone asked me to go on their podcast, I would never say no. And I think that's for a lot of people, whatever you enjoy, you don't mind not getting paid for it. But if it's something that you don't see your career going in that direction and it's not something you're really passionate about, then hundred percent. And I think a lot of influencers now have become quite entitled when people ask them, Hey, do you mind? If I send you an outfit, do you mind posting it? And people are outraged. Like, how dare you ask yeah. me? How dare you ask me to post something on my feed? Because I've worked years for this platform. I've seen it so many times. And I just think, they've just asked. There's just a no question. You need, can just say no. No need to it's out them. Choice. No need to criticize yeah. them. And no need to, you know, say to them, you're asking me for free labor. 
you're not. They ask you a question. Mm. It's very common in the industry to ask for collaborations. And for a lot of girls, that's a really nice thing that someone's offering you an outfit. And I see all the time now, obviously, that I've launched my influencer agency, um, Influencer Reach. You know, I've got, you know, I'm so fortunate to work with such beautiful influencers mm -hmm. and girls. That I've had such a good relationship, you know, and they come from all professions, right. from singers to bloggers to, you know, uh, presenters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every time I've asked them to do a collaboration photo shoot, mm -hmm. it's very rare that you'll say, but I will only do it if I get paid for it. Mm -hmm. You will get on the odd occasion. Yes. They will only do a, a collaboration photo shoot, right. a campaign, if they're going to get paid. Right. But now it's, the tables have turned a little bit. And now I feel that influencers or, you know, professional girls are coming to me saying, Anisha, will you do some shots for us? Mm. We want you to creatively direct our, your, you know, our shoot. Yes. And we want to create a beautiful campaign mm -hmm. because you've got the experience. We see all the amazing campaigns that you're doing and, you know, we want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's such a shame when girls, like you say, are being entitled and only mm. see I get it. It's your profession. It's your yes. livelihood. And you've got to make money. Yes. But there doesn't have to be money associated with all the time. Not every opportunity. Not every opportunity. If there is an opportunity where you feel you can do a campaign photo shoot. Yes. And you're going to get stunning images out of it. Right. It's content for your social media. Yeah. Why not? I think that depends though. Because let's say if it was me, for example, mm. I wouldn't personally, it's not a route I want to go down. Does that make sense? Of course. So for some people, let's say that their full-time job is to be a content creator. That's their full-time job. So if they have to take one day out of missing a paid opportunity to take it, then it's not going to work for them. Yeah. But if it's, for example, a brand that you really want to work with I, or something that you really want to do, then I think that argument stands. I, I also think we have to respect content creators and influencers for their platform at the same time. But I'm, what I'm trying to get from this is you never know what something could get you. And so if there is an opportunity and you're not doing anything that day and you're not that busy that month, let's say, for example, you will see a lot of people saying, yeah, that month I'm going to collaborate. But on the months I'm really busy, you're not going to. It's very difficult. And they will they will say, like today we've done a beautiful collaboration shoot today mm -hmm. um, for a presenter and she wanted to do some beautiful shots yeah and you know sometimes you know we what I'm very proud that I really do support my girls and mm. I get them paid work mm. I do because there'll be times where I'll go to them and say I'm going to give you this beautiful product yes and I'll invite you to my amazing launch yes. that I'm doing for this brand yes and there's called gifted and mm. you write on Instagram gifted hashtag yes. gifted yeah and again it's your choice I'll always give them the option I'll never pressurize any of my influencers celebrities I'll be like this is brand I'm working with mm. they really love your profile they love your engagement Right. They love what you represent. They love your personality. Mm. Would you like to do this? And yeah. I give them their choice. And right. if they say, Nisha, no, we're not going to be able to do this. This mm. is how much we charge for a reel. Yes. This is how much we charge for an Instagram yes. grid post or story. And I've mm. got everyone's rates. Yes. I then go back to my client yes. and they will pay. Right. And that's it. It's got to be fair. It has there to be. will be some creative collaborations of course. where you will work free. Uh, but like you said, it's creating opportunities and it could open up so many other avenues and doors. And most of the time, they're all paid because mm -hmm. I myself educate my clients that you've got to respect bloggers and influencers exactly. because they don't see the amount of content time, editing, photoshopping, exactly. all the work that goes into planning their content and their strategies. Even this podcast, how much yes. work have you gone to, yes. to doing, just setting up these questions, mm -hmm. this set, this studio? Mm -hmm. I think everyone forgets that. Absolutely. It's very easily missed in the creative industry. But I want to ask you around the PR thing. So obviously you want a PR agency. As a brand, if you're working for them, can you guarantee people can post? Because that's really difficult now, isn't it? Even when I gift gift bags for the podcast, I can't force people to post. How do you manage that between the brand and the client? So I set the expectations really clearly for my clients mm. because even though it's not just a specific PR agency, it's mm -hmm. an influencer agency. Right. But what we do, because PR is getting press. Yes. And I used to be pressed because I used right. to be invited as an editor of a magazine to all red carpet events, product launches. Right. Now we've seen a shift. They want press. Yeah. But they now want influencers. Influencer press. Because yeah. they want to reach the influencers audience and followers mm -hmm. to get their brand awareness out there. Right. So we manage the client's expectations. Right. We will always present our list and say, these are all of our girls that we work with. Right. And we don't just represent Asian girls. We've got right. Caucasian girls. We've got Afro-Caribbean girls, Oriental girls mm -hmm. from everywhere. Even, you know, some of my influencers are global. Wow. And, you know, they are based from the USA to Dubai to 
to even in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we will send them the list with their insights, mm -hmm. a media pack that we then create for all of our influencers. And we will say, these are the ones that we feel yes. will be best suited for your marketing campaign right. or your product launch. Mm. And then you can decide. And then mm -hmm. I'll go out to all my girls and say, would you like to be part of this campaign? Right. Would you like to, you know, attend this event and mm -hmm. launch? And like you said, if they're available and they like the brand, mm -hmm. they'll all come. Right. And I did a, an amazing jewelry product launch um, in Mayfair um, on Friday. Mm -hmm. And all my girls came because the brand was so unique. It mm. was just so diverse. It was an infusion of Asian designs with Western statement. Mm -hmm. And they loved it because mm. it was a different, very unique kind of concept. And they all got a beautiful influencer box gifted mm. they posted the revealing of the box right and then afterwards if we want to take them to the next stage and say can you create a specific reel right or a grid post on this mm -hmm. then obviously some of them will do it you know because of the love for the brand yes and some of them will say well there's a rate associated with it and Absolutely. you have to respect that so it's about managing expectations of both the influencer the celebrity and the talent with your brands absolutely and like we said previously it's good that we respect people's choices because for, for some people it could be a dream come true to work with a brand and for other people it could be like yeah I don't mind I like the brand but it's something that I'm gonna have to put a lot of work into mm. because it's not something I've dreamt about my whole life and I think that's the kind of wedding discussion going back to it again for some people planning a wedding is something they've wanted to do their whole lives and for other people it feels like yeah, I get it that we kind of need to do it, but it's not something that I desperately want to do. Yeah. Now, the question around big weddings, and this has been happening a lot recently, is is it moral to have a big wedding anymore? There are so mm -hmm. many bad things that are happening in the world. We constantly presented with a new crisis, constantly presented with different donation options. You should help here. You should help here. There's a war going on here. There's battles going on here. Should really people be spending, you know, millions on weddings so you know i've got priyanka and J priyanka chopra and nick jonas they spent eight hundred thousand pounds on their wedding charles and diana from ages ago i know that's really old but <laughs> you know they spent 110 million back then and you know you're looking at these shakes that are spending 100 100 million isha and barney spent you know seven million it's crazy mm. it's getting to the point where it's like you know people in india for example these indian celebrities and i'm not criticizing any of them i'm just looking at it from a different perspective is could you say it's immoral? How people say, you know, it's immoral to almost be a billionaire and hold that much wealth. Could you say it's immoral? I would just say, and I would flip it, say, is it immoral to go and buy yourself a designer bag mm. when there's so much going on in the world? Right. Is it immoral for you to go and have a fine dining experience in central London for dinner? Right. Is it immoral for you to literally go and have an amazing holiday? Yeah. In the Maldives? Yeah. You can look at it in every aspect of your life. Why should it also be defined mm -hmm. or changed because of weddings? Mm. No one, I think every girl um, at home has a designer bag. Everyone. Or works hard. I know I did. Yes. My first wage when I was working in retail in Harrods I saved up my money mm. to go and spend it back in Harrods again, <laughs> you know, and that's the thing that you do because yeah. you want that designer bag. You yeah. want those first designer pair of shoes. You right. want those premium designer makeup products. You know, right. you want to get your hair done. Absolutely. Why should it define you as a person? I agree. You work hard. Mm. That's your hard earned money that you have, you know, literally saved for. Mm -hmm. Why then can you not spend that kind of money on a wedding? And it's your choice. I know recently somebody went to a wedding and I think they said they spent four million on it. And everyone was like, you know, they should have given it to charity. And it's like, well, they probably do give 10% of their that. wealth to charity. How do you know that they're yeah. not giving yeah. to charity yeah. and they're not doing their server and they're not doing charity mm. work and they're not helping mm. just because when you're doing charity work Shivani you don't have to gloat about it no you don't have to you know scream from the rooftops that you're doing charity work and everyone's really humble about it and mm. they make their donations and they do it quietly they don't need to literally make noises about it and it's all about percentage so let's say my disposable income was 100 million if I want to spend 4 million on a wedding why not then that's how much I have as disposable income yeah because the other 96 million you don't know what I'm doing with it exactly. maybe I'm investing maybe I'm helping small businesses yeah. maybe I'm giving it to charity and I guess that's what I really wanted to portray on this is whatever your opinion whether you think big weddings are a waste of money whether you think that it's immoral whether you think that we're all pressured to do it it's really important to understand what you want and it's really important to understand 
understand what aligns with you. Absolutely. And not feel pressured. no one should be judged Mm. on, you know, what they want for their wedding. If they're going to have a small wedding or a big wedding or a spectacular destination wedding, why should they be judged? I think the reason why people are judged is generally everyone who gets married is really obsessed with their wedding. And I think from an, and it's always so funny, it makes me laugh because um, before people get married, people are like, oh God, this girl won't stop posting about her wedding. Every rock shop on them, <laughs> you know, rock shop on them's coming up. Everyone will post their wedding photo of their brothers walking them down the aisle for that. Every time it's a birthday, wedding photo. Every time it's Mother's Day, wedding photo. Every time it's Father's Day, wedding photo. Every occasion possibly known to man is a wedding occasion. Oh, <laughs> it's my one one week anniversary or it's my six week anniversary and people are like no one cares yeah. but nobody does care about your wedding apart from you and I think that's the important point literally nobody cares yeah. you want to have a small wedding have it you want to yes. have a big wedding have it yeah. stop worrying about what other people, other people care because exactly. they actually don't care yeah so they're going to judge you either way either way With whatever you do wedding, or that auntie and uncle wasn't invited or you weren't invited everyone's going to talk about it anyway mm -hmm. and they say they don't care but they actually do because they want to know everything. They want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And if you're not invited to that wedding, you do. Lots of people get really disgruntled. Honestly. Was invited to that wedding? Were you invited to that wedding? I wasn't invited to that wedding. Anyone who's listening to this podcast, <laughs> please don't invite me to a wedding. I, I really don't want to come. Hey, you're coming to my wedding. Okay? <laughs> you are. You will be invited to a wedding. But, you know, I think the point on one, on one of the things I wanted to talk about is expectations between couples. So one thing you've mentioned, which I think is really nice, is that now you're seeing a lot of couples coming in having that conversation with each other, rather than with their parents and their aunties and their uncles, and there's like 20 people in the room. What's one of the things that you recognize doesn't work in terms of setting expectations? It's been hard, I, I, I will be honest with you. I have planned a, a few weddings now mm. where there's a lot of tension between couples. What has been nice to see is that, as you were saying, brides can get quite obsessed with their weddings. Yes, they can. They are. You can have bridezillas. Yes. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it is their be all and end all. Yes. They wake up and they think about their wedding. Lunch, they're discussing their wedding. Dinner, they're discussing their wedding. Even in their sleep, they're probably talking about <laughs> yeah. their wedding. And it does take over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's been nice, actually, the, the couples that I'm planning the weddings for, the grooms have been so actively involved. Really? They have a say on what they want with the theme to the design, wow. to the colors, to the flavors of the cakes. They come for the tasting right. for the food. They come for the tasting for the cake. And I've just been like, this is really nice to see. I love and to I hear love that. And I love the unity of the couple mm. that they're actually making decisions together. So even as a planner, when I'm now asking the bride who normally makes a decision, right. some guys are like... <laughs> babe, you decide or darling, you yes. decide. Yeah. We'll go with whatever you want. Yes. That's really sad to see because it's your wedding too. Yeah. It's a wedding of your unity, of your love. The groom is just as important as the bride. Yes. And you both should have a say. Yes. And make all the decisions together. And brides and grooms are now sharing the costs. They're splitting it 50-50. Right. Which is a great thing to see because, you know, certain cultures, which I'm really against, by the way. Okay. It's that pressure that the girl side of the family should pay for the wedding. And does that still exist? It still does. And certain wow. cultures, the guy, the girl side of the family will pay for majority. And sometimes it'll be like a 20%, 80% to the girl or no a 60, way. 40. Now I'm seeing couples just split everything 50, 50. That's how so it should be. That's exactly how it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, when I get married, I think it's only fair that of it's course. both of our days. We should just split everything 50, 50. Give your partners a say. I would say my advice would be to couples to set your expectation from the get-go. Talk about your budgets. How much do you each want to spend on your wedding? Right. Whether it's 50,000 from the girl, 50,000 from the groom, mm -hmm. put it together and think, right, this is how we're going to do it. And mm -hmm. then have a budget of how much you want to then assign to catering, how much you want to assign to the venue, how much you want to assign to the DJ. Mm -hmm. And that's how we do it as wedding planners. We work on a whole... Uh, amazing kind of like Asana program where we break down everything of the budgets right. and how much you're going to spend. Mm -hmm. That would be my first advice. Secondly, really identify from the beginning your vision. What mm -hmm. do you want? Do you want to have a destination wedding? Do you want to have a civil? Do you want to have a traditional wedding? Do you want to have a religious wedding? And make sure you both have consensus on it. Right. And then listen to one another. Mm. If the groom is saying, I really want to have fireworks at my wedding, you know, because that's something that I want, 
as a bride, you know what, respect what your groom wants. Right. And if the bride is saying, I really want to have, um, you know, a, a performer or singers or dancers for some sort of entertainment, find a, a nice middle ground. Right. You're both getting elements of your wedding mm -hmm. that you're able to then share. And I would just say to brides, you know what, really let them have a say. Mm. Where a lot of couples go wrong is a bride takes over mm -hmm. and wants to do everything herself. Or sometimes where the grooms go wrong is where they don't take enough interest. Right. And don't support the bride where the poor brides are having to deal with everything. everything. If you guys work together to literally deliver and create this dream wedding that you both want together and you work hand in hand, mm -hmm. I think, you know, what you're going to have such a beautiful time planning your wedding. And at what point do you think you should have these conversations? Is it before you get engaged? Because I'm sure you've seen a lot of couples break up and we're seeing that a lot now. It's really it's sad. It's really sad because I think the families aren't aligned. They're not aligned. Mm -hmm. And these conversations are scary to have before. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're dating and you're asking someone how much you want to spend on a wedding, it's uncomfortable. It when you're dating somebody and you say, I want to have a really big wedding. Now, one point I find quite one point I found hearing from other people's stories quite interesting is the bride wants something big. The groom wants something small. Let's just say this for an example. It's very common. And the bride has said, well, I'm willing to pay more. And the groom has said, I don't want you to pay more. What do you do in that situation? Because his ego is being damaged. Absolutely. And you do, you do see this a lot. Mm. And you've just got to find a really happy medium for both of them mm -hmm. to say okay why don't I come up with a solution that where well, you're not spending so much mm -hmm. but the bride still gets an element of what she right. has envisioned yes and there are lots of options out there mm -hmm. because we always say this is your low budget quote right for, with the supplier this is your middle ground quote right and this is your premium quote we right. always offer three to four different quotes from different right. suppliers so if you said i want a dj mm -hmm. i'll give you then three different djs or four different djs that work within different budgets right and then it's up to you of how much you want to some couples will be like okay you know what we haven't exceeded the budget as much as we wanted so at the end we've here. got you know a little pot still left mm -hmm. so we will now go for the the sports car yeah. Or that vintage car. Right. Or the helicopter. Right. You know, they will then assess it like that at the end. So they'll pick their premium option for yeah. whatever they want. Where it can sometimes go wrong is when I feel sometimes the family start to interfere. Mm -hmm. And I've witnessed that a lot. Right. Where there's a lot of pressure from the parents mm -hmm. and the in-laws um, because, you know, they weren't certain things in their way. Right. And, you know, sometimes as a wedding planner, you're literally in the a middle. mediator between mm -hmm. the two families and you've just got to make sometimes the families understand because their way of thinking is sometimes very different right from the younger generation mm -hmm. they want the traditional to say indian lunch yes sometimes the couples are like well we don't like indian food and we don't want an indian lunch wow. and it's about finding that ground be like well my solution would be well we'll have some live cooking stations mm -hmm. so you'll get one station for the indian cuisine mm -hmm. where you can have your traditional food we'll have a lebanese live station mm -hmm. we'll have an italian live station there you go you've accommodated everybody right that way both parties are happy the families are happy so that's what our role is. There's so much pressure, Shivani, as a wedding planner. I can imagine. Because you're literally holding the, their hand. You're consoling them day and night. Mm -hmm. You're on that journey with them for a whole year. Mm -hmm. You go to all the consultations with them from the start with the caterer to their tastings, all the way to their bridal appointments. Mm -hmm. And then when you see them on the day, it's so emotional just to see how happy they are. Right. And that they finally Got are that. there to that mm -hmm. day. And all I advise my couples is enjoy that day. Mm -hmm. You know why? You've spent so much money on your wedding. Right. Everyone's enjoying it, but yourselves. Yeah. I want you to switch off. I always say to my couples one week or two weeks before, right, no more wedding talk now. Go and enjoy yourself. Go and, you know, check yourself into a spa. Go for your bachelorette hen parties, your stags, mm -hmm. and go and enjoy yourselves. Pamper right. yourselves and now enjoy this moment. Mm. But some people can't switch off. We're all guilty of that. I can't of switch course. off either. Yeah, I go on holiday and I'm always working. Yeah. But I feel sorry for myself and my partner because I don't know how I'm going to switch off from my wedding. <laughs> Imagine being a wedding planner, getting married, and then literally, you know, normally when you're on your headset, it's going to be team you. Are like, you're going to be in the mud up. You're going to know from your look that something is out of place. But you know I feel what? like you're going to be in your mud up with a headset piece <laughs> in your ear. That's what you're going to be Do you doing. Know what? There's bets on that at the moment. 
there's bets on that saying, and she's just going to have a little earpiece in her ear <laughs> saying, right, you need to move that cake to the right just by five inches. Um, and lots of brides actually want to go down and right. check their room even before the wedding started. Wow. They just want to have that peace of mind. I think it's really easy to become really obsessed. And it I is. think that's where a lot of the arguments come from. And it it's all about understanding a different perspective. And understanding a different perspective takes you to take that personal responsibility to say, I'm wrong in this situation, or I understand. But a lot of people change their minds, Anisha. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of people before the wedding who say, well, their engagement, and they say, I want a small wedding. And they speak to their parents, and they speak to their friends, and they check their TikTok, and they check their Instagram. And then they're like, now I want a big wedding. Yeah. It's really, what's one of the most common things you've seen as to why people are breaking up their engagements? It's literally they're arguing about the smallest trivial things sometimes. But don't you think that? And their personalities, I think, come through because they get stressed out. And then they're bickering mm. about all their wedding details when really it's not even worth arguing about. But if you can't handle the arguments during your engagement, how will you cope with the Absolutely. life during marriage? So that's why I say to everyone, if you see too many red flags during mm. your wedding planning and that whole journey in your process, I'll always say to them, please try and work through it. Go and take, even go away for a few days and work on your relationship with one another. Right. But if you really feel that you're not compatible and weddings can bring that out of you. They do. Because they're life decisions. Right. And if you can't handle a decision as like a few decisions in your wedding planning journey, how are you then going to make big life decisions? Mm. Your next stage is going to be buying a house, mm. buying cars having kids, mm -hmm. deciding the children's education, mm -hmm. you know, you're adapting. There's a lot of pressure on the, the the women as well because you're getting married, you're leaving your family home, you're leaving even sometimes your own personal homes if you live alone. Yes. And you're going to live um, with this whole new family. Right. Which you may or may not know. Some yes. people know them, um, yes. you know, for many, many years. You're giving up your surname. You're giving up your whole entire world to go and be with this family. It's a lot to take in. And there's a lot of pressure for women. A People say pressure. it's the same for men. And I'm like, it's just not though. It's not. It's not the same as a no. man coming into it. It should be, by the way. It should It be. should be equal that when a man comes into the woman's family, that it's, it's the same pressure for a woman to go into a man's family. But it just isn't. Especially, right. I think, and I'm just going to talk about my own experience, not that I've been married. <laughs> but just from what I've seen, yeah. the expectation is totally different. And you challenging back as a man just as I've talked about in all my podcasts, is completely different from you challenging back as a woman. Absolutely. And the respect element of a man coming into the woman's house will always be from a parent. My daughter's with that man. So I'm going to be 10 times more conscious what I say. Absolutely. Whilst for the woman whose son's getting married and bringing a daughter in, it doesn't make a difference. No. And I think that it's there's such a big difference in terms of that expectations for a woman and for a man. Absolutely. And people still say that there's not. No. There's there's lovely men out there that I've seen that yes. really make their, you know, their newlywed brides feel so welcome. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful to see. Constantly asking, are you okay? Are you comfortable with this? Is that right. okay? Um, you know, if anything was said inappropriately or if anything was said out of line, mm. you know, I will address it. You wow. know, and I've seen that. And then I've seen the complete contrast where it's just so dismissive. Oh, but they didn't mean that. But, you know, they just want the best. And, you know... We've just got to accept it. We've just got to go with the flow. And you do see that a lot. And that's where you start to see the cracks in the relationship a little yes. bit. And it puts us in such a hard position of because course. you see so much. And, you know, your brides become your friends. Mm. And at what point do you intervene and advise them? It, there is that. You've got to know where to draw the line sometimes. But it's all about your relationship with the bride. Right. Sometimes you can become so close that they really confide in you. Mm. And they lean on you because they've got no one else to talk to. Because they can't talk they to their parents. They don't want to talk to their friends because yeah. they feel friends will their friends will judge it, yeah. and they will judge the partner. Mm -hmm. They can't talk to their parents because the parents will be like, leave them then. You're, they'll you always be on your you side. You don't need to do this. Yes. It's fine. We can call off the wedding. 100%. Done. It's done. Don't worry about it. And sometimes they lean on you and they just need to, to release and they need to let it, you know, vent it out. And then, you know what? They sleep on it. They go home and they say, you know what? It's another day and he's changed. And like you said, if they acknowledge where they go wrong. Yes. Don't be afraid or have the fear of apologizing when you're in the wrong. But that's with everything. With everything. Your relationships with your friends, to mm -hmm. your relationships with your siblings, to your parents. When you are in the wrong and you've been disrespectful, you've crossed the line. Yes. And we've all done it. Just apologize. But the difference is it when you apologize. It goes a long way. And I think real character shows that when you apologize and somebody still criticizes you, yeah. but you've apologized, then there is really nothing you can do. No. 
if you have apologized and you've admitted your fault, not if you've been they defensive. Can't let it go. And if they can't let it go, and if they haven't seen your perspective, then that is on them. Then it's on them. Exactly. And I think that's what's really interesting. And you've said is that you see you know, you, you understand, people have to understand that you can't always tell your parents everything because your parents will always support you. They will never support the other person mm-hmm. as much as they love them. Yeah. You know, some parents give a different perspective and my parents were always people that would always be like, no, you're in the wrong Shivani. Same. You know, I was just going to say, my parents All the time. always say, but what did you do? Yeah, what did you, you do? You must have said something. Exactly. You must have done something exactly. in order for that person to react that way. Yes. But that is when you know that your parents have raised you in a exactly. really good way. And they're rational. And they're not deni- They're not in denial. Yes. And like you said, they're rational. Yes. They're balancing both sides. And I respect my parents so, so much exactly. for doing that because whenever I tell them something, they'll say, we understand you're upset. But okay, let's look at about it from a from different, different perspective. perspective. Yeah. Always. They'll never just say, Shwani, you're right. And we agree with you 100%. Yeah. At the end of the day, I know that they will always have my back. But I really respect people giving me a different opinion on something. And I think that's a really important point to realize and what we've raised in this podcast your makeup artist is that person on the day with you when you're panicking when you have cold feet when you're nervous when you're feeling sick that comforts you your wedding planner is almost like your therapist that's holding your hand and that person there that isn't going to be biased and they have no they don't know you really no. so they don't have all this emotional you know, what, attachment exactly an emotional baggage i tell my mom something that i've been upset about something i tell her on the wedding day she's going to be like you've been going through this for a year and a half you've been doing this for four years you can't be in this anymore yeah. i tell you and you'll be like it's okay it's a small thing yeah don't look too much into exactly. it exactly totally different and i think that's what i really wanted to bring out in this podcast Everyone has a different purpose. It's not just what is said on the tin. No. And, you know, whether you want to have a big wedding, whether you want to have a small wedding, it's your choice. And you should do what is within yourself to do it. Yeah. Don't do it for other people because then you yourself will feel that kind of guilt or that uncertainty or that insecurity of, I don't want this. But, you know, whether it's a big wedding or a small wedding, go for it. Just don't post on every rock shop on them. <laughs> Happy birthday, Father's Day, Mother's Day about your wedding because honestly, yeah, it's a bit much. Don't do an overflow of social media posts because, yeah, yeah so it's a bit be a lot yeah especially for your lovely single friends yes, who are like exactly. waiting for their like literally for their <laughs> prince charming to come along and they're like, or even if like, not deal with another, another yeah another wedding post again yeah, you know some people do get really affected by it i mean i i, do. I don't really care but i know some of my friends that have actually felt that you know i feel really upset that all my friends are getting engaged and i think because i've never from a personal perspective, I've never dreamt of a wedding. I'm not that girl who's like, I can't wait for my dream day. I've dreamt of having a dream house and I've dreamt of having a family. So I think when I have kids, I'm going to be one of those really annoying moms that <laughs> posts about their kids, kids all kids. the time. I'm definitely going to do it. And just, you know what? Unfollow me now if you don't want to see it. But it's be like, Shivani, can you please stop posting about your kids every five minutes? Look how cute they are. I do it about my niece and nephew. I actually got told last year, do you have kids? They actually, I got invited to a PR event with, with my niece because they were like, bring your daughter. I was like, oh, she's, she's actually my niece. <laughs> But what a compliment. I tell the same thing when I take my like yeah. loads of pictures of my goddaughter and my godson. Right. Oh, I thought you were married. And yes. I thought you have kids. No, nope, not married. Happily single. Yeah. And content. But you know, it's really for some people it can really affect them and it can really bug them. And you know, if you are getting married and you do have a single friend, maybe just take that into consideration of not constantly talking about it. Hey, we've all been there. Imagine I'm in the wedding industry and everyone's like, Oh, so when's when's your dream day? And you know, when are you getting married? Um, you don't go asking people that all the time. And I get asked that all the time. And it's not coming from a bad place. No, it's not. You know, they just it's want not. to know, you know, when is it going to be your time? You've yes. seen so many of us get married. You've, you know, done the most amazing wedding campaigns. Yes. You dress brides day in, day out. You style them. You plan their weddings. Yes. When is it going to be your time? And I just say when the timing is right. But and you it know, used to affect me, Shivani, a lot. I think it doesn't affect me. I find it very annoying. And I kind of find it illogical when people say to me, so when are you getting married? How am I meant to know? (laughs) How, why, why are you asking me? Yeah, I'm going to ask right now. Right. Like, why are you asking me? And sorry, what's the question in that? Because do you think I'm going to tell you? (laughs) It's May the 8th and you're not invited. If you wanted to be asked, if if you wanted to know when I was getting married, if you were... If you were going to find out, you would have found out. But if I'm single, if I'm in a relationship, or if I'm engaged... Don't ask the question because if I'm engaged and you haven't got the invite, you're not going to be invited. (laughs) And if I'm single, do not ask me when I'm getting married because I'm not going to ask you, you know, when you're getting divorced. It's not a question you ask somebody. It's actually, I understand. It's not, you know, asking somebody when they're getting married is never coming from a bad place. But the girl doesn't know. 
Don't know. I when don't I, when know. When I know, I'll tell you. I'll yeah. call you. I'll send you a memo. I'll let you know. <laughs> but, you know, at the, I just find it so funny when you go to an Indian wedding, and this is one for the aunties. When you go to an Indian wedding and you're with a girl, you have to understand that despite how strong whatever they are, at some point in their life, they have felt pressured. I'm very strong on this, but there have been points in my life where I have felt pressured that I'm not married by a certain age. When am I going to have children? And, you know, why am I not rushing? Why am I not thinking about it? I am thinking about it, but there's a reason why I'm not. And that's my choice. And it's not up to you to question it. It's not up to you to ask me why I'm not, because not in my situation, but some girls are really going through it. And I met somebody the other day and she was in her thirties and she said, I'm marrying this guy. I've been with him for 12 years. And I said, oh, wow. I thought you would have just recently met him. And she said, we had a lot of stuff to work through. And I thought that's so powerful so much because respect. so many, she, and she said, so many people came up to me and said, you've been going out for too long. And you know, you've been, you guys have been like relaxing and you haven't been thinking about it. And she was like, I wanted to work things out, but I didn't want to start my marriage off in a bad foot. So I had to take those years to change myself and he had to it's take those years to change did. himself. Yeah. And if you go up to someone and ask them why they're not married and they're going through something, it's only going to make them question it more and it's only going to make them feel worse. So just avoid asking the question. Yeah, I think everyone just needs to really think when you ask that question, what is that person going through? Mm -hmm. Do you think that person doesn't want to be married? Right. Does anybody, okay, some people do want to spend their yes. life alone and that's their choice. Yeah. Just the way some people don't want to have children. Yes, that's completely their choice. their choice. And they want to live alone. And again, it's all on personal preferences mm -hmm. and personal choices. But you know, next time you do ask someone that question, really think about why? what are they going through mentally? And why are you asking it? And why are you asking it? Don't mm. you think they have got that desire to want to get exactly. married? Don't you think every woman or girl dreams of having their dream partner or companionship, whether yes. they want to get married to or not? Yes. And, you know, we've all been in relationships. Mm -hmm. We're all trying. We're trying yes. to date. It right. just hasn't worked out. Exactly. And I'd rather be sure now than get married and it end in tears or go exactly. through that divorce. Exactly. I'd rather take that 12 years or those Same. 10 years to be with someone mm -hmm. and know that this is the man that I want to spend the rest of my life exactly. with without any doubts and without any questions or any red flags exactly. and be happy. And, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm so grateful that my mm -hmm. parents, of course, there used to be that pressure initially that yes. your younger cousins got married. Yes. That, that, you know, that family's got married. Oh my God, that cousin mm -hmm. of yours has just had a baby. Yes. And you used to really feel the pressure saying, you know, why? It's because you work too much. Mm -hmm. You are too focused on your career. Yes. And that's why you're not getting married. Mm -hmm. And you are too, um, you know, you're too career focused. You're too confident. Mm -hmm. You're too, you know, you're, you're, you're too empowering. Yes. That people feel like, you know, you're going to be quite intimidating in a relationship. But someone won't feel any of really, those things. And one day when that guy comes along, yeah. he's going to love you for all, all of those, those things. Reasons. Yeah. He's going to love so that true. you're successful. He's going to love that you're confident. He's going to love that you're empowering. And he's, and he's going to be that it. right guy that's not going to be mm. insecure and is going to embrace you as a successful woman. A hundred percent. And I think that's the kind of partner that you need. Yeah. And when you meet that partner, you'll realize why it didn't work out with all those other guys. Oh, I completely agree. And, and that's the difference. Mm. So wait as long as you need to. Yes. My parents are not pressurizing me anymore because they want me to be happy. Exactly. Rather than come back divorced or exactly. broken. Um, they'd rather say, you know what, you just wait. We're not pressurizing you. You just make sure you're happy. And I've got no regrets. Mm. I've had the best 15 years of my career. Mm -hmm. And now when I do get married and have children, mm -hmm. I can look back and think I had the best 15 years of my life. Building my brand mm. and working towards my dreams and my goals. And marriage isn't the only goal. And marriage isn't the only goal. dream. And it's not the only definition exactly. of being happy. Whenever you ask somebody, you know, but don't you want to find somebody and be happy? I am happy. Happy's I'm not, happy happiness now. Happiness not defined by marriage. Exactly. Only marriage. And so many people get married because they think they have to rather than they want to. Yeah. But I'm content when, like you said, buy your house. Yes. That's an asset. That's an achievement. That's whatever cool. makes you Buy happy. Your car, yes. Travel the world. Yes. Go and learn new things, mm -hmm. new habits, like new hobbies. Do mm -hmm. things that are going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. Don't be pressurized by society so true. on, you know, what is the right age to get married? Who says that you've got to get married before 30? Who says that you can't have a child after 40? Mm -hmm. Who makes this? Yes, it can be challenging and yes. difficult. Mm -hmm. Fine. We know that because obviously that's science and, you know, that's all to do with, you know, the human body and everything. But, who defines and who makes these decisions? Exactly. Do it when it's right for you. 
I agree. And you know, I've had a really great time talking to you today. Too. I think we've really explored so many of the contentious issues that people have been talking about and given a different perspective, which is what I really wanted to do. But we close with a different tradition now. Oh, I love it. And it's a truth or dare. Okay. <laughs> Give me a truth. When was the last time you cried? Oh, wow. Do you know what? I think the last two years were really, really hard for me. They were all struggle. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I can't even remember is a good thing. Yeah. I feel I've really evolved as a, a person. Mm -hmm. I really like worked my way through, mm -hmm. become really spiritual, really strong, and I'm really happy and content. I think the last time I probably cried was when my godfather was taken into hospital recently mm. and it was really touch and go. Mm. And I didn't, we didn't know whether he was going to make it or not. Mm -hmm. And whereas in contrast to, you know, last year where I think when we came out of the pandemic yeah, and it was such an emotional roller coaster, it was. we didn't know whether we were coming or going. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, in especially in the events industry, we couldn't work, we couldn't do weddings. Right. Couldn't work. So I was so fortunate that I had my creative consultancy to lean back on mm. because I was able to create and focus on my creative campaigns mm -hmm. and continued with that, right. which was great. But it was really an emotional time, mm. especially dealing with so many brides. Some of the weddings that we had to postpone were like five times. Wow. And that it can be emotionally draining. But yeah, I feel really happy now. Now it's just tears of joy. Good. Which is great. I'm so glad to hear that. It's so lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on. And I on. can't wait to create a beautiful photo shoot. Thank <laughs> you. You're just a beauty. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on and discussing such a challenging topic with me. I loved it. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. It's never a challenge. And not especially when it's with a girl. <laughs> you. Thanks so much. Hey, everyone. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening or watching, if you could press the like, follow and subscribe button, it would mean the world to me.